welcome to this Women in STEM panel. My name is Caroline Kotze, and I am the founder and chief equity officer at Women in Governance. It is extremely pleasing for me to have such amazing panelists join us uh, for a topic that's always been very near and dear to my heart for, for several reasons. First of all, um, I think we all agree that there's a lack of female participation in STEM industries, and that's been taking place for a long time. We've seen it. And we are going to try to come up with reasons why this is, uh, but also solutions and what we can all do to try to change the situations. Did you know, for instance, that in the 1950s, the IT field was actually female dominated? If you've seen the movie Hidden Figures, for instance, you will remember that women were instrumental in sending these men to the moon. So what happened? Well, men started coming into that industry, women started coming out of that industry. So don't let anyone tell you that women are not made for scientific disciplines. It has nothing to do with that. And we will talk about some of the causes with our distinguished guests that are joining us. Um, let me introduce you uh, to these fabulous women who are joining us from Toronto, from Paris, and from the United States, we've got Gina Cody, who is a corporate director and benefactor of the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Sciences at Concordia University. We've got Crystal Johnson, uh, who is deputy director for technology and research investments at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, Elodie Meyer, who is a partner and chief legal officer at uh, cybersecurity firm Bradley and Rollins. And Melissa Muraka, who is Vice President, Technology and Transformation Strategy at Sun Life. Ladies, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, for our audience, just to give you a bit of an idea of how uh, we're going to be conducting our panel today, I will be doing uh, the questions with our panelists for about 40 minutes, 38 minutes or so. And then uh, our uh, dear partner, Ayumi Moraoki, who is the founder of Women in Tech Global Movement, will join me and she will be the one actually moderating the question and answer session from the audience. So please prepare your questions, hang on to them, you'll put them in the chat, and, uh, and Ayumi will uh, jump on board and uh, start asking the questions. So this is going to be, as I mentioned to my guests uh, earlier, a very informal conversation. What we want is to be uh, engaging, we want to have an impact, and we want people to start thinking of what each and, and every person uh, can do, whether you're joining us from Canada, from the US, from Europe, we're delighted to see that there are people from everywhere. So I will begin my questions with, um, I'm sorry that I have to put my glasses, but I'm at that age, um, that respectful age. Um, so I'll begin with uh, Melissa. Uh, so you've been in tech for, for many years. Uh, I just want to have an idea of what you've seen in terms of additional barriers or obstacles that women might face when they want to uh, enter your industry? Um, so maybe something worth sharing. In the last few years, I've been quite interested in um, connecting with younger women, young girls, girls in middle school, because I feel that's the moment where we're all born with great confidence. We're all born with the ability to do anything we want. And with time, either the external factors social factors, family factors start shaping our beliefs and also media. And I feel uh, young girls and I having two of my own, I see the confidence. I see my daughters asking the question, why can't cars drive themselves? Why can't, you know, women propose to men um, just out of what we're typically used to, right? And what I realize is uh, girls in middle school start getting pressures and what, what, whenever they thought they can do something with time, it gets shaped differently. So I think it's, it's about catching our, our girls at an age where they're confident and having all of the female leaders really invest their time to ensure that that does not go away. Uh, so while we do that, I've also experienced in the last few years, uh, just in the last 15 years at Sun Life, the amount of women leaders that I'm noticing in um, the organization. Uh, gender is no longer a factor. If you can do the job, don't care what gender you are, um, you know, you're know you you're in for the running. So um, I think at this point, what I've experienced is if there are any limitations, at least my personal experience, 
it comes from within. We, send, mm -hmm. we tend to create our own limitations because of our beliefs that are often manufactured by what we see and don't see. Um, and so, well, it, yeah. from within, I fully agree. And, and I see Crystal uh, nodding as well. I think we all know the importance of coming out of your comfort zone and overcoming certain fears, et cetera. But do you feel that maybe society dictates certain behaviors from girls have certain expectations? hundred percent. I mean, I, I look at, like I said, I'm looking at my two girls, the commercials they're exposed to, the games, the toys, just everything, the colors. And I'm thinking, why? Why is it girls is this, boys is that? So it's quite interesting. And you're not as, well, at least I wasn't sensitive to it until, I, you know, I'm, I'm growing my own family and I'm recognizing it. Um, and so, yes, I, I definitely think there's external factors, but I think it's, it's our role as female leaders to kind of break those barriers. Um, and expose them to what normal is, uh, or you know what the trends are, and it's it's and again, there's that age group where uh, they're second guessing themselves. Their interests are different, um, and they move away from from really the the, the opportunity of achieving great things. Uh, they underestimate themselves. So it's I really do believe it's um, it's not only about um, you know, giving women who are already in the workplace opportunities and encouraging them because they're under different pressures, social pressure, family pressures. And we saw with COVID, um, you know, the COVID has hit so many women and now finding themselves as the default for still working, but home care, dealing with homework, et cetera. Um, so it's really about women being strategic and who their partners are <laughs> and, uh, you know, getting the support system recognizing that um, you know, the way you run a business and get consulting and contractors to do work for you, do the same thing at home. Um, you know, get consultants, contractors to do the work that you have zero interest um, in focusing on and really adds no value to your career <laughs> or family life for that matter. So that's, um, I Couldn't think agree there's- Couldn't agree yeah. I'm very good at outsourcing. Um, a lot of interesting information that will we'll debunk uh, uh, throughout the panel, uh, Melissa, but I'd love to hear Gina on uh, one thing that you mentioned about education, about what, what the responsibility is. Uh, you mentioned, Gina, well, obviously you have an interest in, in everything uh, re related to education, but you, you mentioned you feel that there is a responsibility that goes to academia. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, universities have responsibilities and uh, the educational system, even at high school and school, to teach the uh, children that there's no difference whether you're a girl or a boy. Uh, but unfortunately, we see over and over that this is not the case at all the schools. They still, um, even in 2019, there was a school actually in Quebec where the uh, um, grade five, they came and uh, the teacher uh, during science separated the girls and the boys. The boys did the robotics, the girls did gardening. <laughs> 2019. So we need to overcome these obstacles. And, you know, just being here and speaking about the subject matter, I think speaking about it will change the momentum. And um, I see that, for example, at universities, the, uh, you know, at uh, Concordia, for example, we have women engineering. They all go to school, they go to primary schools, they have girls say they have so many programs that these young students are reaching out trying to bring these young children into the STEM field because, um, you know, I've said it over and over, we are in the fourth industrial revolution. We are mm -hmm. at an era that technology is governing our society, the way we live, the way, the way we play, the way we work. So if women are not part of this, building this technology, uh, the world would be built by those who build them. It will be Built by men. So there is a necessity for us to get the women into STEM program uh, for our own future. Because, for example, if there is a, an accident, this is proven that the car safety features are made for average size men. So yeah. when they get into car accidents, 50% more into serious injuries and 70% in minor injuries, while women are better drivers. So these are all the issues that I think the academia has got a responsibility. And as Melissa said, it starts from the parents 
and then transfers to the next level? Very good point. Um, Crystal, you know that, um, well, Gina was just mentioning the issue with the size of, of a woman that made me think of uh, the issue that actually NASA had a few years ago with um, those suits when they wanted to send an all female um, crew. And then they just didn't have the number of suits that were required uh, to send women out. So how has this been addressed since? Yeah, so, so there is a, an inclusion piece that's been added to our core values. So we have four core values and safety, integrity, teamwork, and excellence. And the next one is inclusion. So we are going, I will say not going out of our way. We are making an asserted effort to make sure that we've had diversity for a long time. As you know, hidden figures came from the women that, that grew up where I grew up at Langley Research Center. And I'm one of NASA's modern figures. And, and I didn't even know about them until the movie, which is a shame. But, but one of the most important things, and we've had diversity at NASA, but having the inclusion where you're not only, you know, bringing women and minorities into the, the field, but it's also interweaving and creating an environment that's really conducive and, and supportive of all of the, the people that you've got, because that's really the only way that you can innovate. So there's a difference between inviting people into a room and making sure that those people that are invited into the room actually have a voice. And so we've gone from, you know, me being in a meeting where I ask a question, you know, engineering, especially in the aerospace community, has a whole lot of white males. And so mm -hmm. especially when I started way back in the day, um, I would be in a meeting and I'd ask a question, a technical question to the person there. And the male that's there would not even look at me when answering the question. He would look at the other white males in the room. And I was the only African-American female, of course. And so it's gone from that kind of environment to one where I, an African-American woman, has risen through the ranks of NASA all the way up to the office of the administrator. And now I'm deputy of the largest NASA Center with 10,000 people. So it's come a long, long way, but it really also has a lot to do with the support infrastructure that we've put in place to be able to support women. And for me to be able to know that my power and strength comes from within. And so that is one of the things that we really have to make sure women are taking advantage of. And, and I mean, Melissa hit so many of those key points. You know, yeah. it starts when you're young, but also once you're at Melissa's age, you know, really understanding what's happening around you and supporting the other women as they're waking up themselves. Because for me, I feel like I really woke up late in life and, and she's getting, she's, you know, awake now. Her kids are already awake. So this is really, really cool. And your uh, NASA headquarters actually now has the name of one of those hidden figures, doesn't it? Yes. Katherine Johnson, absolutely. Quite fascinating. So talking yeah. about youth, uh, Elodie, you're uh, by far the youngest one here. Uh, so we talked about the importance of education and you were a lawyer, you worked in mergers and acquisitions and uh, you became a lawyer at a very young age. And all of a sudden you decided you wanted to be a cybersecurity specialist. So when and how did that come across your mind and how did it go getting your cybersecurity degree and, and starting that business? You're on mute. Okay. Um, no, absolutely. So I did start in, in business law, which is also a, a pretty male dominated field in for older generations. And we are seeing um, a lot more women lawyers coming up in, in new generations. And, and that's a, a beautiful thing. Um, for me, there's two key words uh, that kind of touch on what um, other people here have said today, uh, um, empowerment mostly, um, and exposure. Uh, being able to see women thrive uh, at, the, at the top of these fields helps younger generations think that, okay, it is also possible for us that, I mean, we, all, we often hear you can do anything you put your mind to, but that's pretty, I mean, it's, it's nice words and we have a hard time really making it something concrete until we actually see women doing it. And so for me, it's one of the things is, well, so we have the, the Gina Cody School of Engineering here in Montreal, and that is something that has, that every woman that goes into STEM will have this, this 
this concrete feeling of, okay, we have a woman here in Montreal that went to the end of it. And, and, and that's a great thing. Um, I mean, I was always fascinated by computer science as a teenager, but I never, for me, it was never a possibility. And I, I just hadn't thought of it. I didn't think of going into, into engineering or computer science at that point. Um, because I thought, well, this is a hobby. I'm, I'm not doing this in school. I'm not exposed in school. I'm doing this on my own at home. And so lacking that part of the exposure um, made me think it was impossible. And then at some point I realized, well, no, if I want to do this, then I can. So I went back to school, studied uh, uh, cybersecurity on the technical side of things at Polytechnique, not, not uh, the Gina Cody School of Engineering. Um, and, and yeah, and, and I've been in the field uh, for a few years now and, and I wouldn't go back. Honestly, it's, it's an, a very interesting field and we can really see, we can feel the place that other women have made for our generation of women. We're very uh, thankful for it. And Edo, and I need you. We are pleased to have you <laughs> in that, uh, you know, that area that is very, very, uh, you know, missing a lot of women, absolutely. It is. And, and if I can just, you know, continue on that part, there's missing a lot of women at the top at the moment, but we're seeing a lot of women come in. And that's really, a, that, that's where we see that all the work that you're, you guys have been doing, the generation, the, 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 the pre, pre, um, previous pre generations have been doing, is, uh, thank you. Um, we can see that it's actually, we're, we're seeing a difference. It's, it's, women are more and more going to school in engineering and graduating from engineering schools and staying in the field because that's also important. A lot of them go to school and then decide to go for a family, for, for example, and, and not stay in the field. But we're, say, we're seeing a lot more women stay in the field. And that's also something that's very important for the development, development of STEM. So that's actually very important because when I think of female lawyers, uh, many of them end up changing uh, because they either they're working for a large firm and they don't see any women at the top. So they all graduate young female lawyers. They come into this big law firm and all the partners and manager partner, they're all male. And then around 30, 35 years old, they tend to either want to be working on their own or do something else. So Melissa, that uh, brings me to an important topic of retention and promotion of women to decision-making bodies because we don't only want them at the bottom, obviously we want them everywhere decisions are made, like RDB used to say. Um, so you as a leader, what do you do to empower people on your team to make sure that they thrive and that they're able to advance their career? Obviously I'm talking about women. Yes, so um, we all know, and many of us probably have been through it, and if not likely have heard colleagues that um, <clears throat> You know, having a family and a career is not easy. It's actually really hard. However, if you love what you do, you will find solutions to everything. So for me, most important, at least for my team, has always been really having a good heart-to-heart -heart conversation of, do you love this? If you love this, then it'll feel like play anyway. <laughs> so um, it's, you know, and if it feels like play, you will always find a way to solve for all of the challenges. You won't think about uh, what you can't do versus what you can do. I've had some of uh, my staff where I already saw them playing the role of a director and I had promoted, I remember one person promoted her and she's looking at me saying, there's no way. I mean, I'm in the middle of COVID, my two sons are home. There's no way I can do this. And I'm like, you're doing it, whether you like it or not, because you're already doing it. So just go for it. And uh, you know, I will be by your side along the way. So it's really about making sure that your team feels supported giving them flex time. I think, um, you know, I, one night I was putting my little one to bed and I was texting and working at the same time. I said, give me well, a minute, I have to yourself, touch my son in. What was that? You yourself have three young children. Yes, correct. And, but I think just exposing my normal life and I'm a mom too, and makes them feel real. And, oh, I, I could totally relate. You're not just this person who's always connected, always working. No, I have a life outside of work. And I'm, I'm able to balance. I know what's, when it's right for me, I, what I'm in, um, you know, I'm really focused on delivering my, my work, but it's really letting, being vulnerable to the team and exposing your strength and your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they feel like they can totally open up to you. And the more they open up, the more the relationship is built and the more, you know, you can support them and know where you need to flex and where they need to flex. Um, also, you know, when I uh, first, in my previous role, I had a tech role 
And I have to say, um, we don't, the, the female population in my group is only 23%. And so as a result, we really were purposeful in thinking through how do we attract more women to our team? And it's about how you write the job description. It's about how you communicate. It's about who's part of the interview panel. Um, you know, you're not going to attract women by having a panel of just men interviewing them. It's not going to happen. So we switched all that up. In six months, we went up 43%. I myself have been through interviews where it was only men. Then I looked at their org chart and I'm like, there's no way I cannot see myself working for, again, for an organization where there are only men. It just feels today archaic. And there's, it's, there's something about the energy that's different. And so really it's about getting your women front and center, connecting with the staff um, so that, you know, women attract women. I held a, uh, I hosted a women hack and a hacker X. So hacker X is really a bunch of developers coming together, doing like a thank a set, um, you know, for potential um, firms who want to hire at the hacker X were probably five women who showed up in tech. I held a women hack. And there were 60 women who showed up. Mm -hmm. So women, I, I was scratching my head, say, why they're out there? Why only five showed up? Women attract women. Um, so it's, it's, the, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation then, because there are so many. You know, you're 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 one of few uh, leaders in, in in tech, female leaders in tech. There's more men than women. So, what advice to these men? Uh, <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> well, the advice is, um, you know, I think you have to think of team building. Women are awesome at team building. It's not just about the tech stack. I, I've also read recently more and more organizations are looking for soft skills first before tech skill. A tech skill can get be acquired. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what builds the team, the energy are the soft skills. Um, so, you know, un appreciate the value that that's what retains the team. Um, so, I mean, I'd start there. The, the list is long, but I would I'd definitely love to hear your thoughts, Gina or Crystal on, on that, because the list is long and it's, it's important. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the <coughs> points that you made is, is absolutely critical. When you talked about the fact that you kind of took the leadership role in showing people the importance of work-life balance. Um, it's, it's really important for all of our leaders to not just kind of do it, but for us also to set boundaries. If we really want to attract women and we really want to let them know that it is okay for them to do care, you know, provide care and be working at the same time, we have to actually do it and we have to kind of set the, 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 the bit for them. Oh. So for instance, even for the men in my organization, if a man comes to a meeting, when I've set a meeting and they're supposed to be picking up their child from practice or they're supposed to be going to a performance or something else, and they're like, okay, well, I gotta hurry because I, I was like, what are you doing? No, the priority is family, go. We will deal with this another time. And making sure that people actually take their leave. You know, I, I made all of my employees start early in the year, putting on the calendar when you're gonna be on leave because you have to take some time to refresh, you've got to have some of that downtime. And so as women leaders, if we set the environment so that that environment is, is, is um, amenable to both men and women in terms of supporting family, supporting priorities that are not just work 24 hours a day, because you get a whole lot more out of your employees if they have a balanced life than you would if you try to push them and make it feel like a jail cell when they're in the office. So that was a, a really important point that I wanted to add on to there. Great, Gina. I actually, it's a gradual progress, just uh, uh, following up uh, on Melissa and Crystal's uh, uh, great inputs uh, that uh, yes, we need, but if uh, Crystal is not sitting at the top table, uh, there wouldn't be that flexibility. If Melissa yeah. is not sitting at the table, the mm -hmm. flexibility doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole change of environment, it becomes an important issue. And hence, you know, bringing more women in the STEM, promoting them to the positions that they do uh, based on their merits, they belong there. Right. So I think uh, the whole issue is how do we bring them in and retention. And one of the biggest issues for women is uh, work-life balance. It's interesting because we all brought it up and every conference that they speak up, always the women pick up their hand and they ask me, 
how do I keep work-life balance? And my answer is, have you, I have never heard this from a man. And you guys are partners. There are two people who are taking care of their children. Why do we women always feel that they are responsible for the entire uh, chore, household chores and childhood care, child care, all of these issues? So I think we need to also, uh, there's that unconscious doing by women and men that we pass that uh, responsibility to a partner that shouldn't be really carrying all the responsibility. And Melissa at the beginning said, you need to choose your partner rightly. I think that becomes a very yeah. important issue for women that uh, it would be very difficult if uh, you are carrying the entire load. So always yeah. from the beginning, set boundaries as uh, uh, Crystal as well mentioned that you know what you are carrying and what's your partner. I mean, that's an important thing for the progress of women, we have to set our place in the workforce and at home to be successful. And but Carol, then, one, one other thing I wanted to add sure. to that, in terms of retention, one of the things that's really critical, yes, work-life balance is important, but also when you're in the workplace, one of the challenges that I've seen over the past 30 years with the women who do come in is they're not getting the high profile opportunities. They're not getting the assignments that give them the, the credentials to continue to, to promote them through the organization. They're not getting those real opportunities because the gentlemen are favoring their friends and so forth and so on. And they're getting the high profile opportunities. So as women, we've got to make sure that when we are in these organizations, we're also giving our females lead opportunities and, and any exposure that, that we can provide for them is helpful to, to make sure that their resume is padded with all of those things that they need so that when those positions come open, they're a shoe in for those kind of positions. Nobody wants to be just handed a job. We wanna make sure we get the right experiences and exposures so that we can just step into it and succeed. I took the quote on that, uh, Crystal, which is a very great point. Uh, I remember I had, this is like over 35 years ago, I had an ad in the newspaper at those times, we didn't have social media or anything. Nah. And uh, this lady shows up and she was seven months pregnant for an advertisement for a job position in, and it was in the accounting. And uh, I said, oh my God, you, how far are you? She says, I'm seven months. And I said, and you're coming for a job interview. She said, yes, because I'm quite capable of, I can do the job. And I said, I admire that you are hired. I, <laughs> I don't think if I wasn't a woman, that would have happened. And I, I called my uh, um, HR person. I said, cancel all the other interviews. This woman, and she was a hardworking. She, after she gave birth, she did it from home because she could at the time. So this having, as Crystal mentioned, having women in these positions gives that opportunity. And uh, otherwise we would have missed that talented group of people that are able to produce. So important. And the comment you were making, uh, Crystal, just earlier, I wanted to do a little segue into mentorship and sponsorship, because I think that's also part of a responsibility that we all have. So yeah. can you tell us what, you know, especially I would add in your case, Crystal, being one of the rare African-American women, uh, do you feel that you have even more of a resp responsibility to be a role model, but also to mentor and sponsor? Yeah, I, you know, I do, but, but not because society has put that pressure on me to feel that. It is truly because I am passionate about seeing other women succeed. That is just something, you know, when I can touch a young girl's life and really help elevate her or give a woman an opportunity to change her life, to, to you know, switch into a, a career that she loves or into a job that she loves. For me, that is so fulfilling. So I take it very seriously when, you know, when someone, when I see that someone needs the mentoring, I will approach her. And many times, you know, women have approached me, you know, to be a mentor. And that has been really helpful for me. So you also have to, when it, when it comes to mentoring, you need to not be myopic with the kind of people that you think are the right mentors for you, because some of the best mentors in my life have actually been men. 
And so when you, when you think about where is it that you want to go, what is it that you want to be doing, who's in that job or who's doing those things, and then have a conversation with them because that is actually the direction you want to go and maybe not exactly the way they did it or exactly how they're doing it, but it, at least in the right direction. And it needs to be, what, whomever your mentor is, it needs to be someone who's not just focused on themselves and their job, but someone who also has a similar heart in terms of wanting to help others succeed, not about my, my, my. And so that's really important when you're thinking about what kind of mentor do you want? I've had men and I've had women and both of them have been really incredible in helping me throughout my career. I think the point in common that they have to have with you, the main point of common is that they must be as invested in your success as you are. I think it's this there is, you, go. you know, then, then, then you know they're the right yeah. person. And just as a yeah. reminder, for, uh, our attendees, this workshop is part of our mentoring program. And uh, once we will be done with the conversation and the Q&A from the audience, uh, then I will be introducing the co-chair of our mentoring committee who will be facilitating conversations between mentors and mentees from our program so that they can go more in depth uh, on the topics that, that we're covering now. So uh, super important to have internal mentoring programs, but equally important to have external mentoring programs where the women can actually have someone who is not only invested in their in their career, but their you know their 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 advancement, and and the person can feel free to show their vulnerability, which they might not do to a colleague or a superior, and talk about things that they might not be as comfortable uh, to talk about within the workplace, but that are equally important to allow them to to advance. Melissa, I think you wanted to jump in earlier when Crystal was um, was speaking. Did you have? Um, Oh, yes, but the thought, I think, uh, escaped me. So we'll just move on and it'll likely come to me. Sorry. <laughs> that, that, that happens to me on a, on a regular basis. So I wanted to speak about um, the importance. So we, we spoke about wanting to support women, girls, really, at an early age, um, what society dictates. Um, mm. And the other piece that's extremely important is unconscious bias. And I think I'll start with Elodie on that topic because I'm sure everybody has something to talk about. But Elodie, you are not only a woman, you're a young woman. You're a young woman in a male-dominated field. Uh, you're a partner in your firm with, I think, three other men. And so you're part of the executive. I think you're the startup you launched uh, during the pandemic. Uh, you've got about 40 employees or something like that. So probably... The fact that you're a woman out of the four partners there, you're a woman and you're a woman who's maybe 15 years younger than the other men. Does, do you feel people, you know, I don't know, judgment, unconscious bias? And, and if so, how do you react to that? Absolutely. I think that unfortunately, unconscious bias is, is something that we all feel at, at a point or another, um, both in the STEM world and in the legal field. When I was really more a, of a business lawyer, I think that on, on both sides of it, um, of course, the age has to do something with it. And uh, frankly, I would say that the age probably has more to do with it than the fact um, that I'm, I'm a woman. And I actually like to think that it is more the age than the gender, because that means that we've been doing something right, right? Like that, that the needle's been moving. Um, and I mean, it's, it's normal to think that younger people have less experience. We just have a different way of of seeing things, we have different life experiences, but that doesn't mean that we have no experience or that we don't know what we're talking about. And I've been very, um, I've, I've, I've been very lucky to have, yes, three uh, male partners that are all three, you know, proper uh, uh, women's champions, like we call them, like men that will take into consideration uh, women's opinion. And it's important for them to have women at the table. Our, our executive table will never have just males because that's just not how they think either which, which is an amazing thing um i mean even though they are great there are unconscious biases at time because those are things that were constructed over many many years generations and sometimes well it's unconscious as we say it right so we don't necessarily realize um and what i think is the most important is that these men are, are open to hear it to hear about it to talk about it and, and to you know, kind of realize that, okay, this con unconscious bias exists. Um, let's you know, dive into why and, and is, it, uh, is it pertinent to have it here or not? And most of the time having that discussion is when we realize that, okay, I had an unconscious bias, I shouldn't have, and now I'll, I'll you know, go next step, 
uh, and, and now I'm conscious. Now I'm conscious, and so, so I'm less biased. I, 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 <laughs> Absolutely, and and I think that it's you know as I said, I think that somewhere there there's a a question of like um, being a, a younger woman also makes me feel it more maybe at times. Um, but I think that the move, the needle is moving, and and that's a very good thing. Gina, do you think ageism now going to the other extreme? Does that ever come into play, especially in you know such a you know in STEM and high tech or in any discipline that is more uh, you got to be part to uh, unconscious bias? Uh, I'm not. I think unconscious bias is in all of us all the time and yeah. i think it's shows itself in different shapes or forms and uh, that whole issue that for generation we never talked and thought about it and i think being aware of your biases you have to constantly overcome it you just have a bad experience in a bus with somebody and all of a sudden you make a whole decision about the whole race and the calling it out all the time. And, uh, and I have heard from many women that they had a boss who was a woman and misbehaved. And I know that they always have a, we should, or maybe we shouldn't have a different bar for a boss man than a boss woman. But we get hurt when we feel that we are betrayed by another woman. And I have heard that many times from a lot of women. I think we need to call it on be conscious about it regard because it's not going to go away. It's going to start at the LOD's May age and it's gonna, not going to end, end at my age. It's just going to continue. Just keep thinking about it and keep correcting and resetting. Because even yeah. at, at myself, I say, oh my God, I shouldn't think that way. And I, the minute I'm aware of it, I think the whole thing, making it conscious, as you mentioned, I think it's quite, uh, extremely important. And I do yeah. agree that we're all, we all have them. I mean, I catch myself on a regular basis and I'm so ashamed. I'm like, how could I think that? But, we, but it's, it's true. And the more we catch ourselves doing this and the more we're going to prevent it from happening again. And I think talking about it within our workplaces and having actually unconscious bias training and workshops and saying, you know, for everybody, not just for those that you point out and say, you know, Joe and Bill and Mark, no, 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 everyone, including the women, should talk about this. Crystal, you were at uh, the White House, at the White House Office of Science and Technology before joining NASA. Uh, was it any different in terms of the way people were behaving and conscious bias and, and all? No, no, unconscious bias is everywhere, no matter who is in office. I, I went over to the White House under George Bush, the last day before the election when Obama was coming in. And so I was there at the end of Bush and, and through the whole transition to Obama. And then Obama asked me to stay for another year. So I was there with both Republicans and Democrats. And it was the same in terms of people because it's a people thing. I, I think Gina made one of the most important points for everybody when it comes to unconscious bias. It's important to put the mirror up in front of your own face every single day and every single, single interaction. Just see what your unconscious biases are and deal with those. And when it comes to someone showing you an unconscious bias, what I always say is it's like a gift. If somebody gets ready to hand you a gift and you don't accept it, then whose gift is it? It's theirs. You never have accepted it. So when someone has a bias against you, whether it's because you're a woman or because you're black or because you're gay or because of what, whatever it is, that is their issue, not yours. And the moment you allow somebody to walk in and throw their, their problems on you or their issues on you, you will allow yourself to be on a roller coaster ride for the rest of your life. You can be at work doing wonderful things. Somebody walks in and says something, all of a sudden it's ruined your day. When you give the power over to somebody else to control your emotions, and to set your day, you have truly lost control of your life. And so it is really important for us to understand if they have an issue, that is their issue. And you have to know what you bring to the table. And, and most of all, you can let your actions speak for you. Like in Melissa's case, or not Elise, it was the other young lady, Elise, um, the younger <laughs> generation. 
when someone comes to the table and they're younger and someone has an impression that, okay, this person is young, they don't have much to say, let your actions speak for you. So yeah, they have an issue, but then when you come to the table and when you do open your mouth and it's impactful, it shuts that down because there's only so much pretending people can do when they actually can look at you and see the value you bring to the table. So that's, that's awesome. So well said. Well, on that note, although I have uh, half a dozen more questions for each of you, but I want to open the floor to questions from the public and uh, invite uh, my friend Ayumi Moraoki to join us. So she'll be the one asking the questions. And before I give you the, the mic, Ayumi, I just want to say among the things in case you know, you don't have a ton of questions coming in. I'm sure you do. Um, but there's, um, there's a topic that I find important also is uh, how do we close the wage gap, the gender wage gap in STEM? Like it's like everywhere else. But, and I know Gina had a few ideas about this. And the other piece, and both Melissa and I've heard Crystal speak about that in the past as well, is how do you overcome your fears? Mm because I think that that is key. And I will leave it to that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you take the questions from the public Ayumi and take it away. And I'll, uh, I'll be back in about um, at 12.55. Voila, go for it. Well, thank you, Caroline. Lovely to be here with you, lovely lady. So um, I would love to get one of those feedbacks, Crystal, for instance, how do you manage your fears? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for me, I understand that there are some clear and present danger fears, which means, you know, you're about to get hit by a bus or something that is really, really real and you can see it, it's tangible. But those other kinds of fears that come into your mind about it, I'll give it a couple of examples, but when those other fears come into your mind, really it is false evidence appearing real. Those are the kind of things that are intended to keep you paralyzed and keep you from actually realizing your dreams. So many times it comes in the form of, I'm not qualified, or I don't have enough years to be able to, to, to hold, my, you know, hold my own against these other people, or I'm not, if you're trying to start a business, I, I don't have the right skill sets, or I don't know who the right people are or whatever else. So for me, when I get those kind of fears, and I know there's this little voice, you, you, you have the voice that says, this is what I wanna do, then you've got the other voice that throws in all of those things that become fears, because if you keep it in your head, it's larger than life. And it's so large, it paralyzes you and keeps you from even going after your dreams. So for me, all of those little voices, I write down every single one of what those fears are. And for each of those fears, I say, okay, well, let's, let's be real here. If this really happens, then this is what I'm going to do. And th these are the possibilities. And the next fear, you write it down. If that happens, this is what I do. After you get all of those fears on the paper, then it becomes a lot more manageable. And it's not the big scary monster that it is when it's sitting inside of your head. And you actually can have a game plan for each and every one of those. And then you can finally say, all right, it's manageable for me. I'm going for it. I'm going to do it. And so really taking it from your head to the piece of paper and thinking through deliberate strategies makes a lot of difference. Thank you, Crystal. I think I'm going to do this next time. And when did you learn how to do it? Did you, did you used to do this when you were still a young child or was it through mentoring no. and through the struggles? <laughs> It was later in life when I was getting ready to move from, so I had gotten a job offer to go to NASA headquarters and I did not. So I was living in a, a rel relatively rural, it's a, um, a, a place that's not in the city. So I was gonna go from Virginia to Washington DC. And I was like, I'm not a city girl. I had just had a baby. My mother-in-law was taking care of my son during the day and my mother was taking care. They were sharing the responsibility of taking care of my baby. Everything was perfect. We had built a house, I had decorated and everything, but then I got the offer to come to NASA headquarters and take on a job there. And then the fears just went crazy. Who's gonna take care of my baby? And as a baby, they're too young to tell you if somebody touches them the wrong way or does something to them, they can't speak. And then what's my husband gonna do for a living? And where are we gonna live? And so many questions just started flooding me. And I almost got to the place where I said, I can't go. We just can't move because there are too many unanswered questions. So at that point, I was forced to just kind of write everything down and get it out of my head. I talked to my husband. I was like, should, you know, this, 
this is the offer that's come. And I thought he was going to be the person to say, no, we can't move because I don't know what I'm going to do and all. He said, Crystal, if you need to do that for your career, then we have to go. And I was like, no, you were supposed to be my out. What do you mean we have to go? So I had to deal with all of the fears, every single one of them I had to deal with. And we jumped off that cliff and had a very safe landing when we jumped. So it was really worth it for me. That was a, a big point in my life that changed the way I look at all things. Because too many times we are paralyzed by fear and we don't ever really go after our dreams and our goals because we're afraid to. That's so true. It reminds me of what Ginny Romati said that, that comfort and growth never come together, right? You have to Ooh. go through these <laughs> challenges Absolutely. for growth to reach. And this brings me to Elodie. Elodie, I loved your, your journey, your path going from law and then, you know, trying to retrain, reskill into, into cybersecurity. Um, how, are, how do you think women are shaping the tech sector today and more specifically the cybersecurity sector? Now, how do you foresee how the women are going to be bringing in, you know, forming the, the tech sector of, of, of the future? Well, <clears throat> I think that women have a lot to bring to the tech sector um, in the future. There's a lot of, you know, a very different, a different way of approaching uh, the field, a lot of different ways uh, between, you know, like how, how they'll approach a certain project or a certain task in particular. Um, and, and we kind of see how that moves, um, that, sorry about that. And we, we kind of see how that helps. Um, I lost my idea there. <laughs> It has so, yeah, women, how, how it's shaping it. We, there's a very different way of approaching things and seeing things. Um, and, and these different approaches make it move around in a way where we're, we're making place for women. Uh, it's not just how men see it and how it should always be in the, be doing like recurring things. The stuff that doesn't work, we're making a change to something that actually does work or having the conversations about, okay, this doesn't work. How about we try and do this, this, this? And make it work. I think that there's the, the fact that women have had different challenges, had have had different opportunities as well. Just make make them a completely different person when they arrive um, in the field at some point, and and that difference of perspective will just shape the field in a different way. It, but it'll take years. Of course, it's not something that's going to happen, you know, today, tomorrow, or even in a couple of years. It's gonna we're gonna see concrete difference, um, you know, many years down the line. Uh, but we're, we're already starting to see some of that some of that change um and i think that just you know continuing to empower women at a young age uh continuing to make sure like uh, melissa was saying earlier that they don't lose the side of where they have this will of of going into stem fields and then they kind of with different types of of, of um difficulties they they shy away from it if they don't go through that phase then we'll probably have different women coming into the to the field a few years down the line Thank you. I completely agree with this, Elodie, which brings me to Gina. Um, so we, we often talk about how we have to empower women, how we have to fix women somehow. What about fixing or trying to change the environment for women to work in? So I would say, what's your piece of advice, you know, for all the tech company representatives to make the environment for women more, um, more welcoming so they can be more, you know, they can feel more at home and, and not um, you know, come out of tech like most, like so many do, right? So there's a bigger um, rate of women leaving the tech sector than there, there are men. Um, do you think, what would be your advice for those tech companies? Firstly, the, the tech companies have to realize that women are half the population. If you're making apps just for men, you are leaving purchase power of the other 50%. So it's to their benefit, to their economy, <laughs> survival, to have women on the table. So they need women as much as women need uh, their jobs. So they need to create an environment that is more welcoming to women. But the list is a long list. And you know, they, they have to be allies with women. They have to be have to have a better child care in society. It goes a lot of issues that women need support, but also as was mentioned by uh, my um, distinguished panelists that you know, we need to have women at the table to, to be able to change the conversation. 
And <clears throat> if the tech companies realize that, and it is proven, McKinsey and company did a study, companies that are more gender diversified are 21% more profitable. So you wanna be profitable. If this is a smart business, it's just not morally and ethically right. We need to be a smarter business people and the tech companies do realize that and they want women in the horizon. The only thing is the demand and the whole work-life balance, they may become an issue for some women. And as more women get on the top, I think we will have a better uh, level playing field for women to uh, progress on there at there and get the promotion and have a you know flexibility as crystal was mentioning that she, you provide an environment that they feel they're welcome mm -hmm. and i think this is so important also so the work that you know the women in governance is doing led by by caroline with this mentoring program that most of you are in here where they're teaching for this executive program, we're teaching you know, vice presidents to become board members, to become presidents and CEOs and really lead the company from the top. So I think it's really that kind of, of empowerment and giving uh, women the reins. I think those are one of the solutions that we can find, right? To, 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 to lead from the top down. Change, I think, so often comes from the top down rather than you know, from the bottom up. And Melissa, I loved what you said about women attract women and your example with the, um, with the hackathon. It is so true, right? Um, I experienced this with, with women in tech events because it's a women in tech event, all the women come and then it's almost hard to find men to come as well. So I don't know where, where the issue, how we can try and find a way that both can feel, feel welcome to an event, whether it's not just, you know, the hackathon, but why do we have to say it's a, it's a woman's hackathon? Um, but if we just talk about tech itself, what do you think it's, um, it's happening, like the most exciting things happening in the tech sector today? And if a woman who wants to go into tech today, what should she, you know, if she wants to reskill, where should she go? Where do you think it's going to be the most exciting opportunities where you know, the doors are going to be open, where they're going to have to be, you know, the, the most growth possibilities for them? Um, you know what? Right now, the whole tech industry is super attractive with, uh, with COVID has really stretched the minds in terms of our ability to adapt in new ways of working, our ability to work virtually using tech, our ability to actually transact uh, through tech and digital only. Um, what used to seem impossible prior to COVID has now been possible just getting wet signatures on contracts no longer needed um, because of COVID, right? And so tech is definitely um, a hot spot. And you know, I remember in, in the 2000s, um, there was a bit of a challenge, um, but that's completely changed. Uh, what I what I love about tech, so I'll just speak of my experience and what I'm seeing. What I love about tech is every day's you're, you're tackling something different. There's no sense of routine. So if you don't like repetitive work, tech is the place. If you want to um, test new boundaries, challenge status quo, create, uh, find new ways of working, um, you know, eliminate constraints and, and wastes in the system, tech is the way to go. Um, you know, people think it's, it's a dry topic. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's ever changing. Um, tech involves lots of teamwork, collaboration, um, you know, even process in terms of how you make tech happen. You're constantly learning and, and changing the ways you work. You're constantly collaborating across the board. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just fell in love with tech because it's a nice balance between, you can go pure tech, you can go tech with a combination of business. Um, you know, it's about bringing a strategy to life. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it, there's, and finding good talent is hard. <laughs> uh, it, the talent pool is so scarce. Um, and yes, you know, people are afraid of the tech industry, but you know, everything I just heard all of us say in terms of all the limitations, the reason why there are so many limitations is because of our perception of what we think we can and can't accomplish all driven by fear all driven by, you know, just even men not showing up to women hack and women not showing up to hacker X that's driven by fear or a sense of discomfort of will I fit in? So, um, you know, I, I, I got into tech because of fear. I got into tech because I was, a, I saw tech was the future and I didn't even know how at the time to turn on a computer. That sounds awful. 
but that's what it was. And I said, there's no way I want to feel vulnerable like, like this again. So I went straight and, uh, into tech. So um, yeah. So Thank I'll just you, Melissa. There. So I think you're the greatest role model we can have to get more women in technology. You know, listening you like the living proof of how we should have more women in tech. And say, having this said, thank you so much, Caroline. I hand it over to you. Thank you, Hannah. Well, Merci beaucoup, uh, Ayumi, en direct de, de Bretagne, from uh, Brittany in France. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to, to participate. For me, it was key, especially that we've got uh, this uh, partnership. Uh, our, both our organizations, Women in Governance and Women in STEM, have partnered on a mentoring program. So I think we are, I know we are part of the solution. Uh, we all know that... Uh, all companies are now increasingly either tech-based or tech-enabled. So, you know, whether you want to be a woman in tech or wherever you want to work, I think it's key that you ensure that you're well-prepared and well-supported and well-mentored and, and we're here for you. So um, I want to thank our distinguished panelists. But before I do that, if you'll give me a second, we're going to put the slides up of uh, all the organizations that have helped us put this together and uh, um, especially Sun Life, obviously, who are uh, the presenting sponsor of the event, uh, Desjardins, who are the mentoring presenting partner uh, of the program, and Women in Tech, uh, who are our distribution partner, our annual partners, Air Canada, Avenue Cambridge, La Presse, and The Globe and Mail, as well as our parity certification partners and our governance training training programs uh, partners. Uh, we do have uh, governance training only available in French, the Formation en Gouvernance. We have an early bird code on the next slide, please. Uh, early bird code that you can use before June 30th. Um, if, you, if you speak French, that's the slide right after this one. Thank you so much. And uh, also a quick reminder for those of you who are in Montreal, there is a gala coming up on September 15th where we will be recognizing all organizations that have received Women in Governance's Parity Certification. And a little shout out to uh, Sun Life, who are the only organization that have been platinum five years in a row since 2017. Uh, we're quite proud of that, but there's 74 organizations that have done the certification last year. So we're extremely pleased to see the uptake of organizations. As you said, Ayumi, what can organizations do to close the gender gap, and that's key. We can't just pin it on the women and uh, you know say, come out of your shell and your comfort zone and overcome your fears. Yes, but what does the organization have as a responsibility? And Women in Governance has this great parity certification program where we support organizations that want to close the gender gap in the workplace. So as a last note, I'm gonna say again, a big, big thank you to all our panelists. So Dr. Gina Cody, uh, again, Corporate Director and Benefactor of the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science uh, at Concordia University. She was calling in from Toronto. Dr. Crystal Johnson, who is the Deputy Director for Technology and Research Investments at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, who was calling in from Washington. Elodie Meyer, who's partner and chief legal officer at cybersecurity Bradley and Rollins, who was calling in from Montreal, and Melissa Muraka, who's vice president, technology and transformation strategy at Sun Life, calling in from Montreal. And now, without further ado, we're going to open the floor to our mentees and our mentors who are currently within the program and the co chair of our mentoring committee. Ray Kazan will be moderating that conversation. The rest of us, we will leave you. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to Ayumi. Thank you to the wonderful Women in Governance team behind the scenes, who's done a stellar job as usual. And uh, Ray, the floor is yours, my dear. Merci tout le monde. Thank you so much.